Okay, so I am beginning the recording of the foundation meeting and we'll kick it off here. I wanna thank everybody for joining us here. Uh, to, and at, uh, as you can see from the first slide I'm trying to share is just a big shout out, by the way, both to Cindy and to Mike for their leadership on the two fairs. We're gonna talk more about the fairs here as we come into it in the presentation, but I just wanted to salute both of you for the tremendous work in organizing and planning and, at, uh, and executing on uh, both events, which as we all know, right, you know, I mean, this is a, this is, you know, we, we expose ourselves to thousands of people during these fair events. So this is a, as a visibility for the Master Gardener program and for our foundation in particular, it's a huge, you know, huge win. So congratulations. <coughs> so here we are today, we've got a full day and it, uh, a full day of things to do. And, um, this is um, not the complete um, agenda here, but it because uh, we're going to run through it. Um, in fact, this is uh, last year's, uh, last month's. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that agenda here later on. <laughs> so, but I tell you what, the first thing I want to get to here is this, that the birthday is pretty slim. This is the slimmest birthday month of the foundation. I just want you to know, right? You know, so, so whatever, none of your forebears, none of your parents, right, were doing much, right, nine months ago, apparently. This is just, this is, the, there's a, there's a, there's a clear lesson here. Only Heidi and Anita, right, have birthdays here. But I tell you, of course, the big event coming up um, this Saturday, this Saturday, of course, the picnic at Terry's. And it, uh, details were in the e-news of this past Friday. Uh, but a reminder here, it's this Saturday, kicks off at 1130. It's a potluck, right? So all we have to bring, there's going to be a barbecue chicken as well as at, um, uh, plenty of beverages. Uh, but everybody's asked to bring a potluck to share, right? Potluck to share. This is at Terry's, you know, it's 112 Rustmeyer Road, you know, off of Highway 105, about nine or 10 miles south of Aberdeen. So 1130 this Saturday, reach out to myself or Terry if there's questions, and it uh, will pick it up from there. So to that point, um, also wanted to remind everybody of a lot of dates that were published in the E! News this week. So in this Friday's email, John and Katie put together a lot of stuff that's happening. We got clinics, we got study group, um, you know, we've got, um, uh, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities for volunteer hours throughout the month. So a quick shout out to, uh, to, uh, to check out the e-news for those details. Okay. Also wanted to, to uh, kick off the day with uh, some very sad news, of course, is that uh, as we, uh, we've lost both Don and Reggie over the past six weeks. And it, um, this, is a, uh, this is very sad news, right? You know, because um, uh, both Don and Reggie had tremendous attitudes and were tremendous contributors and it, uh, their enthusiasm and their fun, you know, and just being with us all was that uh, we'll, we'll be sorely missed. And I mean that very genuinely. So it, um, um, I know that, um, I, I believe you can uh, um, uh, Google the, uh, um, um, Google Don's uh, information as to where uh, memorials are being held. Um, I think we just got his news just last week. And uh, Reggie, of course, was at about six weeks ago when we learned of uh, his passing. So again, um, any remembrances or any thoughts from anyone at, um, relative to Don or Reggie's? Don, this is Karen. Don's um, sir, memorial is going to be held, I think, um, I heard in November. Okay. At the Elks Club in Hoquiam. That's what I heard. Very good. But if, um, no date. Just yeah. not, not, right, not right away. If anyone's tracking that, it'd be great to push that onto an e-news if we, you know, it, once details come about. I will do that when I hear it. Um, I work with someone who's best friends with Don's wife. That's how I have been keeping in, in touch with what was happening with him, so. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else? Um, yes, um, for the, um, the, the uh, who is handling Don's uh, funeral and memorial is online. And I did visit there the other day and it, it made me wonder if our hospitality people who are usually sending out condolences of some sort are ever thinking about doing that. I did leave a comment in the public comment area. Um, a, a good memory of him, of Don, was of when we had graduation. 
and uh, everybody came a little bit better dressed than usual, but he came in full cap and gown regalia. Because <laughs> he was always so cheerful, just, just such a nice guy to be around. And he did good work too, right away as an intern, did a workshop for us on winter twigs. We will with miss John, you. With John. Anyone else? Anyone else? Any other thoughts? This is Elena, and I just wanted to uh, just share with everyone, uh, people that knew Reggie, knew how enthusiastic he was, and every class he was bringing something that he had read, he uh, uh, followed all the WSU professors, I mean, um, uh, you know, Scott, uh, anyway, the, the lady that we had come to the uh, home and garden show that talked, he was so excited to see her because he had read lots of what she had published and whatnot. But every time he came to a, to a class, he had a new idea to share. He was enthusiastic. He was just sort of like Don, just always cheerful always interacting uh, with all the activities. And he wanted to start a children's garden program, Youth Outreach in McCleary. And he was already talking about things that he wanted to do with that. So, you know what, we're, I miss him as a person. I miss him as a budding gardener and uh, everyone else that knew him uh, felt the same way. Thank you, Alina. So with all these guys, you know what, um, you know what, uh, we, we indeed are, um, uh, Mary Shane has indeed taken care of um, uh, recognition uh, on our behalf as a foundation uh, to both. And it, um, um, uh, uh, but as other details come about, you know, for where, um, uh, you know, a physical remembrance or a ceremony might, um, uh, that we might participate in, let's just, uh, let's keep our um, eyes and ears open. So here's the formal agenda, uh, the slide here for today. I'm going to run through the OSU um, to do's. Today is the day we're going to vote. We will vote on the amended bylaws that the, uh, the bylaws committee has been working on since the beginning of this year. So that's coming up. Um, we have a number, we'll open ourselves for announcement. And then uh, Dr. Melissa Fry is here to, uh, from the Burke Museum to educate us, you know, with a, uh, with a, a classic, uh, you know, it's a classic title, Life in the Slow Lane. So it, uh, more on that later. So it, uh, and I know I see Melissa, you're on with us now. And it, uh, I'm, we're very much, very much, very sincerely looking forward to your presentation. So with that, let's uh, let's slip down uh, to Oregon State and look at their OSUs for September, right? Um, um, uh, again, they're talking here about it's time to be harvesting, talking about um, uh, you know it, uh, 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 you know it, uh, managing the tomatoes and managing the heat. It's going to be quite interesting, by the way, with respect to um, late summer and early fall ripening, given the very wet spring we had. And, um, and so I think it's going to be a very interesting time for all of us to be managing, um, you know, at, uh, managing the gardens carefully as we get into what is hopefully going to be, you know, a, a warmish September here to allow um, uh, tomatoes and other things to ripen. Um, Bev and I were down wine tasting in the Willamette Valley over the weekend, and it was very clear there they had a very wet and slow start to the spring. They believe they're at least two to three weeks late. Um, you know, in terms of it, uh, in terms of how the grapes are ripening down there. Um, quick comment here about um, uh, lawns. Optimal time for establishing new lawn is now, right? Um, and uh, I know that we've gotten here in Pacific County a couple questions regarding developing lawns. So, at, um, uh, from people who are new to the area. So, at, um, it is appropriate that we start to, that that we stay on top of knowledge about maintaining lawns so that we can be talking to folks that, uh, that we're talking to. A quick note here regarding first frost is interesting and a reminder here that WSU maintains a weather database, a weather and uh, database on soil temperatures uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other agronomic information that goes back historically. It was interesting noting that in Montesano, right, 2009 or 2019, September 30th was your first frost. 
So, you know, so it, uh, we are not that technically not that far away from uh, from first frost dates. Uh, planting, of course, this is the bulb time. And it, uh, we're seeing a lot of that uh, from the nurseries that are advertising that, um, you know, uh, getting bulbs in and at uh, recommendations in terms of getting calcium and phosphorus into the soil, um, uh, noting that we'll probably have a lot of the leaching of those water soluble nutrients um, as the wind, as the fall, um, as the fall comes on. Um, I know here it's still incredibly dry and it, um, a lot of the uh, fall digging and transplanting that I'm planning, I'm certainly holding off on until, it, um, until I have reliable confidence we're gonna get some rain because uh, it's, it's darn that, uh, it's, it's darn dry. And then of course, pest monitoring, you know, it, um, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, we're going to be talking about slugs and snails here in a little bit later. And this is indeed one of the, one of the points that I wanted to, that I'm so, we're so thrilled to have Melissa with us here today in that there's so many misconceptions and misunderstandings about, you know, about slugs and snails. So at, um, um, and, at, um, and, and at, um, uh, I'm very much looking forward to um, the, the educational spirit of that uh, we'll be able to, to, um, uh, to, to be able to learn more and equip ourselves as be, uh, with, uh, as with better advice to give to the public that's talking to us. So any other comments regarding September? Any other thoughts from anyone in terms of what they're doing for September garden? Okay, no worries. So a quick reminder here. So at, um, Tony, of course, is our WSU liaison educator. Alina and Brenda are our coordinators. Um, you know, uh, we are coming here together today as master gardeners who, are, uh, um, who, uh, who adhere to the program and the, uh, the learning uh, the responsibilities and uh, obligations of the program as administered by WSU. We um, I gather as a corporation, as a foundation. So we are a nonprofit uh, foundation reminder, you know, who per our bylaws, right, have three main purposes, right? We educate and inform our communities on horticulture and gardening. Uh, we fundraise, right, to, uh, to enjoy, uh, to, to, to fuel the programs that we support. And we come together as a community here of, uh, to learn and to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to learn and increase and expand our knowledge base. To that point, then, is that the elected board of the foundation is on the slide you're seeing here today. PJ is our president. Our president-elect is Sabine. The rest of the officers you know uh, and are published here. Pacific County and North Beach um, will select, uh, they select their own leaders, their own directors of those geographic communities. Um, and that leads us then to the thoughts about um, next year's board, because as a reminder, per our bylaws at our October meeting, so on our October 11th meeting, we will vote on officers for 2023. And a salute here to Elizabeth and the entire nominating committee that have spent several months now uh, making sure that we've got a slate of candidates for 2023 that's going to be appropriate for the work that we have uh, going on. Um, Sabine, of course, as a president-elect, will automatically um, um, elevate to the president role. We have an open slot for the president-elect. And it, uh, Katie put out an email to the entire membership um, last week um, asking for interest and thoughts on that. Um, you also can see that we have, a, a, you know, a, for the other, uh, many, the, most of the other roles, you have the incumbents that are uh, uh, willing and eager to serve again in 2023 in those roles. We have an interesting um, uh, conundrum. Uh, I wouldn't say a conundrum with respect to public outreach and education. Those two directorships, we likely, uh, we likely, I say this, will uh, will um, uh, forego. Uh, because we, uh, per the new bylaws, we are going to create a new directorship for the Greater Grays Harbor area, and the Greater Grays Harbor constituency in that uh, in that area, they will select their own director. They will select their director, and it is presumed, based upon the discussions that went into the uh, Grays Harbor directorship uh, uh, discussion, that the responsibilities currently being managed by the public outreach and the education directors will be subsumed 
into that Grays Harbor uh, um, engagement. Sabine, do you want to add and compliment I would, like, I would like to thank you so much, um, Kelly. I would like to add two things. First, I want to absolutely thank Elizabeth for stepping up to the plate uh, with the election committee. Um, because as we had some conversations uh, in the course of it, we found out that I should have chaired that. Uh, there hadn't been a president elect in, I believe, 10 years. And so it was all new to us. And when we came to the job description and found out that I should have chaired it, um, Elizabeth had already done the work. So thank you to Elizabeth and to the committee. The second thing I want to say is president elect. Uh, there hasn't been a president elect, is my understanding, for 10 years. Uh, it may, and I'm pretty much stepping into new territory, if I may say so, and it has been quite new and I'm still uh, trying to get my bearings. I want to let the person know who may consider being a president elect um, when I'm president now going through this pro uh, process of being the elect person and having to learn a lot of things and kind of finding my way for the next person who will be president elect, it is my plan and my commitment to that person to have a very structured approach, what uh, the president elect is expected to do at what point, how to step into it. And so that there is a firm structure, I want to say, for a new person to come in. And, uh, and I hope this will encourage um, someone who is on the fence to just say, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be president um, elect. Thank you. Good thoughts. So anyone here on the anyone here in the call at um, uh, want to add other thoughts here, um, Cindy in particular? Are there any thoughts regarding the Grace Harbor directorship position or any comments regarding? Because you've been you and your team have been spending quite a bit of time thinking about that role and thinking about the program. Um, well, actually, uh, we we are planning a a group meeting in for October, um, at which time, but we don't have the dates. Set nor the nor nor the full full agenda yet. So, but that's for our Greater Grace Harbor County folks to look forward to, and we'll be in touch shortly. Very good. So stay tuned. And I, I do want to bring up one thing, and it, it might be more appropriate in the bylaws discussion. But <clears throat> since I was on the nominations committee and I read the president-elect uh, job description, and then. Just this morning, I read the bylaws, and there's a disconnect between what the bylaws say and possibly the job description of the president-elect. Yeah. So I want to bring that up um, and when we get into the bylaws section of the meeting. And may I answer directly to that? Um, we're aware of it. And the next step after the bylaws are approved and um, voted on and after we had the um, education conference, we are going to work on policies and procedures to include job descriptions. And when you see disconnects right now, the last time the job descriptions were revised were at the same time the last time the bylaws were revised in 2013. So any disconnect you see right now um, will be taken care of when we go to the job descriptions. And since you already have seen them, I would hope you may want to work on that committee as well. So making a plug for that. Thank you. Nicely. Well, well played, Sabine. Well played. <laughs> uh, uh, this is Kathleen. Could I ask a question? Please. Uh, yeah. So as far as the committee that Cindy's chairing, uh, are the meetings open to other people in uh, Grace Harbor or? Uh, I'm not sure who's on the committee or the the discussion, et cetera. Kathleen, we don't we we the October meeting is open to everybody, okay? So everybody will go it, that wants to participate in uh, setting our organization up is welcome to come to that meeting. Okay, so you'll okay. be posting that. Uh, you'll send yeah, an we'll email. An invitation. About... Okay, thank you so much. Yep. We've already Anybody in Grace, Greater Grace Harbor County will get an invitation. Okay. Yeah. So Thank Kathleen, you. we've already prepared a, an email list. You have a special email group, right? That uh -huh. um, Cindy and team. Wonderful. Uh, Jude, you had your hand up. Is there any thoughts you wanted to I, share? I, I wasn't able to hear uh, Cindy. So I was, um, I, I don't know that there's any point in my adding anything, but I thought maybe I might be called upon. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly, we're recovering from the fair <laughs> and getting ready for the fall festival, too. 
Indeed. So we've got a lot on our plate right now. If, if anyone had trouble uh, listening, Cindy, Cindy was making a note is that the, the group is planning, the Greater Grace Harbor group is planning a meeting in October. And so details forthcoming. So stay tuned. Okay. Anyway, again, a shout out to Elizabeth and the entire nominating committee for this work, of course, you know, you know, these volunteer roles are not particularly heavy lifts, but you know, indeed, they are necessary to keep us functioning as an organization. And it um, and all of the service of all of the members is highly, highly valued. Kelly, so, Kelly, can I just, <clears throat> I'd like to mention who the other members of the nominating committee were. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Bev Arnaldi, uh, Lori Birkin. Mike Carvia as, what's her name? Sharon Coolish bales and myself. And if I forgot somebody, please jump in someone and, and remind me because sometimes my- Clara, brain... Clara. Clara. Clara Shin, Clara Shin, who made time in her very busy schedule to, to participate with us. And so Elizabeth, make, make the note that you try to choose, right? That nominating committee with uh, from membership across the generations, right? Yes, across the classes and across um, the counties. Yep. Thanks, Kelly. So shout out to everybody for that work. So this took, we were talking about the fair and recovering from the fair. Quick thoughts here is that, um, and uh, Cindy, I'll let you add any co uh, comments you want to have here. But I mean, look at that, over 1,200 visitors that you know came through the fair based upon the stickers that you handed out. And then, of course, that uh, the kids' activities, you know, that uh, which was which was that uh, you're going to have some pictures here in the next one here, at, uh, in which you it uh, you 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 push kids out to look for what insects, right, were out in the garden, and given all the blooms that were ready at that time, apparently that was at uh, quite a big uh, quite a bit of activity. Yeah. And Cindy, as you as you noted here, the most watchable insect was the great golden digger wasp. <laughs> and so it. it uh, and so that had to be a fun one, because uh, again, the size of the damn thing, you know, and it, uh, and again, the intimidating nature, right? You know, oh my goodness, it's a wasp, right? You know. Mm -hmm. And then I guess this was it, uh, and again, a shout out to two interns here, both Clarks, right? You know, are working to at, uh, you know, working with the kids, and it uh, in making things that uh, in making things happen. Um, Jude, Cindy, any other comments regarding the fair you want to share? Because it was a great success. And again, congratulations to all who volunteered and made things happen. So I would add that, uh, uh, I, and I'm hoping you can hear me now. Can we can. Yes. Okay, okay, great. Um, I, would, uh, I would like to add that we had a, a stellar uh, stepping up by the interns and a lot of our veteran master gardeners too. We were, we were well stocked for the fair. And even though we had a lot of people, everybody was involved in something. We stayed busy. Uh, so it was really a fun fair. Uh, and I think folks enjoyed, enjoyed the activities that they were engaged in. So that was, it was great. And again, as we've said before, I mean, think about that. I mean, this, you know, you know yourselves, you had over 1,200 folks there, right? You know, coming through there. And that doesn't account the number of folks that stopped by the clinic. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I guess it would, would count the number of folks in the clinic, but it's, it, there's, you know there's going to be other folks that we didn't count. And of course, the other thousands of people that would just might have passed by and not gone in certainly are made aware of our presence in the program by virtue of the garden. So, you know, huge shout out to, uh, to everyone making things happen. Yeah. I, I'd like to say that at least one member of the fair board is going to attend our, um, our recognition uh, dinner this fall to show us how much they appreciate our participation at the fairgrounds and during the fair. It's a very good point. I, rec I, re I believe you recall that the, those individuals uh, noted that fair goers in general value, highly value our garden as a key, as a highlight of the fair experience. Yes, indeed. So in fact, uh, probably we, we missed, we, you're right about the count, Kelly, about we caught the, the folks that were there when we were there, but we aren't there for the whole Fair. We we leave at four o'clock in the afternoon. The fair keeps going on until ten o'clock or later. Um, but we don't count the folks that come in after after dark or after yeah. we leave. So there's a lot of people that do pass through the garden then. So that we just don't know about. And again, just from some of the pictures you've shared, it's clearly as as an attraction. You know, it's going to be a magnet not just for the great digger wasp, right, but for the human people, right, that are going to want to come and see some of the flowers and the blooms that are that you've got ready here. Mm -hmm. 
shifting gears to Pacific County, right? We had new digs this year. And it, uh, these are new digs that uh, in a new building that was constructed. And so shout out to Mike here for the work and the leadership that he put forward in actually outfitting ourselves to be at the fair and it, uh, you know, and to, uh, to, and to prepare it, um, the, 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 you know, the look and the feel and the presentations, um, you know, for the, and the activities. And then of course, it, uh, I, I, want to, I want to recognize Jan and that, uh, and Elizabeth for some of the kids activities, uh, particularly this, 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 uh, you know, make a face with vegetables <laughs> board, <laughs> which was just hilarious, you know, and it, uh, I think we all had a huge time, you know, in terms of just, uh, and you realize how fun it was, right? Just to see, okay, what are you going to use for your ears and your eyes, right? You know, and just to, and see what kind of creative activities you're going to come up on. Mike, do you want to shout out and uh, talk about the fair and the space? Well, it was a great team effort by everybody and sure appreciate the valuable input everybody had in it. And the kids' activities was just such a big success, like you were saying. Can't wait for a repeat performance next year. It worked out so well. And we are in a great location. Thank you, Tony Gwynn, for all of your support. And everybody that uh, provided a volunteer shift, the interns showed up and helped out. And so it was a great learning experience. And, uh, and again, the, this teamwork is what made it happen. So uh, thank you, everybody. Jan, any comments on the, I'm um, curious comments from yourself in terms of the design of this plant. When did, where did you get this idea for the uh, make a face with the vegetables? Um, I was just doing a little online looking um, for something with vegetables and ran across. There's actually some really cool artistic adult version of designs of things made with vegetables. Um, much more extensive than this. And I thought, hey, we need something fun because there was no carnival. So yeah. we were looking for something that would be silly fun that would be that would brought, pull the kids in. And that's where this came from. Um, my neighbor, two of my neighbors built the frame for it. And it's just a metal sheet that slides out. So we could certainly use this for other purposes if we wanted to use it, even as a signboard for future. Um, because of um my knee I, I didn't get it finished and i thought okay when it comes back from the fair i'll finish it well um it's currently at the library in ilwaco and it is possibly going to be a traveling exhibit is what i was told so it, it the um use of this extends well beyond what we intended at the fair and then you just basically, you, you got these plastic vegetables and affixed magnets, glued magnets to them, right? That's all it is. So Super a, simple. I a, mean, red, all of that is readily available. And yeah, I just glued, um, it's actually the soft magnet tape, um, which it turns out isn't quite strong enough for some of the heavier vegetables was the feedback I got. So, um, I have ordered some actual disc magnets. Then, well, if if it ever gets back to me, I'll replace some of the magnets. <laughs> the, uh, the 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 comment I want to make here is, is I found I found this to be an interesting exercise that was just intuitive for the kids. That there, there was there was virtually no instruction needed. You know, said so just hey, draw a face with vegetables, and they went to it. So it was incredibly intuitive in terms of how they took to it. Anyway, I'm shout out. Glad Mike. they had fun. Shout out to Mike and uh, everybody who participated in terms of this. That uh, you know, there's a lot of traffic that comes through here from um, uh, from not just the county, uh, but a lot of um, a lot of uh, beach visitors and seasonal visitors uh, come through the uh, come through this booth area. So we see a lot of people from the Seattle area, a lot of people from uh, the Portland area who have vacation homes out at the beach, and at, uh, are visiting. Um, not to be outdone, um, Elizabeth. I know that uh, you had the treasure hunt, right, with the at, um, uh, with the with the kids and so forth. We, we did a pollinator hunt, so the kids had to um, do a scavenger hunt looking for pollinators that were spread out across a larger area of of the fairgrounds, and um, they did very well. And thanks to Jan, who helped support that project too. But yeah, it was it was fun. And, and the, the issue with, you know, we don't, we don't have the kids captured in one area for long periods of time. So it was, it was find something fun for them to do that was relevant 
And I loved the backdrop that Mike put behind our section of the kids section of the, uh, the booth because it definitely relates to pollinators. So lots of learning and lots of it um, and lots of engagement with the people that came through. So shout out to, uh, to everybody that made it happen. So at, uh, with relative to more education for adults, right? You know, coming up in just a week and a half, right? You know, is our state conference. So reminder that the at, um, the state conference is coming up on the twenty eighth through October first. Um, I haven't checked. I don't know, Karen, um, Kathleen. I mean, are there still spots open? I'm at. Um, at, uh, at you might uh, uh, things might be closed at this point. Um, go ahead, Karen. Um, I'm not sure if if it's still open. I haven't heard anything about that. I'm on the awards committee Gary, and picked our awards. 28th, I'm going to. Uh, uh, oh, it is. Good. Thanks, Elena. It's uh, it's still open. It's it still open. Still, it is still open, and there's a sale. So the cheapest price for registration for all the to attend all the uh, presentations is only $159. Okay, and so we're, we're doing an end of month fire sale here. Congratulations. Right, right. Yeah. And the most, uh, the most expensive uh, uh, cost would be 249 and that includes an evening reception and all meals. Uh, so anyway, uh, Very good. If, if anybody needs any information, it's in e-news, the registration information. Most excellent. And again, no excuse for not getting your continuing education hours this year. Right. Yeah, so, sh so shout out to everybody. And, uh, and by the way, as long as we, Karen, as long as we got you at, uh, featured here a little bit, I see that Midge has posted onto uh, the chat here is that there's a photo montage of your at, uh, of the plant clinic table that, uh, that was done at the Aberdeen Sunday Market. Oh, really? I haven't seen it. There you go. Well, you're, you're, you're famous once again. You're going to be trolled now, you know, Karen. Gosh, okay. <laughs> Reminder from Alina and Brenda, of course, to get the hours recorded, um, you know, at, uh, at, um, and again, as you saw in this week's e-news, um, there's plenty of, you know, both Alina and Brenda are very willing to help, you know, folks uh, get into the program and to get those hours recorded. Um, as we've said all along, um, I mean, you think about all the hours we all know we've put in over the past couple of months here relative to this fairs and the, 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 the plant clinics and such. Um, let's get those in while we're still fresh in our minds, because you know, it's going to fade quickly once we get into the fall. And it, uh, we need to get these hours in and because they really do count. WSU really does. It uh, does care very deeply about them. Alina, Brenda, any other comments regarding it, um, getting the hours in? Yes, I just wanted to um, add a little bit more information to this slide. Um, Brenda and I want you to post your all of your impacts by the end of November. Um, that's that's pretty much the drop date. Okay, post all of your impacts by the end of November, um, and uh, I posted a for the e news how to get to the summary page so that you can see how many hours have been verified by me, um, what program categories they're in, um, because you do need to have 10 continuing education hours this year and 25 volunteer program support hours. Um, if you have pending hours, last week, last Friday, in fact, I verified all the hours so if you have still have pending hours, it's because you did it incorrectly. And I can't make those changes. You have to make the changes. So I sent everyone emails if they have um, pending uh, impact hours. And it's up to you to make those, those changes. I'll be happy to help you get there. I just don't have the authority to change them for you. And then um, I think Brenda had something that she wanted to add. I just wanted to add and to remind everybody that um, we have the goal of doing our 2023 recertification, our yearly recertification in Give Pulse later this fall. 
uh, beginning sometime in November. Uh, so members that have entered all their required hours will receive an invite to go ahead and start that process of applying for recertification. So if your hours are not in, you will not receive that invitation. So please get your hours in. Uh, can I ask a question, uh, Brenda? Will you be uh, sharing information on what, uh, what that means, recertification and how to apply later? Basically, it's forms that you got every year. You used to get them via email or snail mail. And it's basically just saying that you want to re-up for next year. Um, we are going to go ahead and do that in Give Pulse this year. Uh, some of the other counties have already started that. I have copied their survey into our group. It's going to be a survey that you walk through, very easy. And so I am uh, fixing that up for our county, and it will be available later, and it will only be available by invitation to those that have their hours in. Thank you. I have a question for Elena, and I think she just left. No, no, Judah who left. Um, Elena, how do we log in um, hours for mentoring interns? Some of us have been spending uh, time in the demo garden and have been mentoring interns um, in the demo garden. How do we put that in? Under what? If it occurs in the demo garden, it's program support. Okay. Okay. Good, if, thank you. If it occurs at a plant clinic, it's plant clinic. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Good. So again, Alina, Brenda, uh, thank you so very much. And again, for everybody on the call here, right? You know, is it any questions at, of any type, right? Relative um, to, you know, get, at, um, give polls, you know, reach out to Alina or Brenda. Holder had a question. She said, will they ever change the summaries to only include the last year, just for those of us who are lazy and don't want to go back through them? I don't know what you mean, Chris. I, I happened to look at mine yesterday because I was wondering about my continuing education. And when I looked at the totals, the totals are the whole totals. So I had to go back in and look at everything that said continuing education and the date it was put in to count up my continuing ed hours. Okay, there, if you go to, the, if you, Go to the summary like I gave instructions for. It's summer, <clears throat> it lists all your impacts, okay? But it mm -hmm. also summarizes it, I think, by spring, summer, and fall, how many CEs you have and how many demo gardens you have. So you don't have to go through everything. Oh, thank you. I missed the, I missed the seasonal summary, okay. but I, I'll go back and look. But again, a good reminder for everybody on these, if there's any particular questions like that, do reach out then to um, Alina and Brenda. Yes, please. Okay, so uh, the big uh, moment here is, it, uh, is it's, it's time to vote, right? We talked about the bylaws in detail last month in a, um, in, during our September meeting. Um, as, as Sabine has indicated here today, you know, um, you know, the committee is ready to have a vote to approve or reject the amended bylaws, uh, at which time another process will begin for perhaps further amendment or very specifically preparation of policies and procedures manuals, which is Sabine noted, right, are years, are years old. And it, uh, it's time to, uh, to update the documentation upon which we run the foundation. Now, at, um, at, um, uh, relative to the vote, I actually have a poll that actually has it, uh, that actually has the voting. We actually can tally the vote electronically from everybody here on the, at, um, on the call, on the Zoom rather. Uh, before I issue the, uh, the poll, um, are there any, at, um, any comments or at, um, any, at, um, Sabine, do you want to um, have any perspectives you want to share? Well, I just want to summarize a couple of things. Um, First of all, it has really been an impressive group of people who have been working 
hard on these bylaws. Um, a, an outside expert, uh, Gary Fredericks, was um, uh, asked to consult and help us, and we compared with other counties. Uh, I did not; uh, I was not part of the committee, but I attended many of those meetings, and um, we ended up having our first reading. After which, quite a few changes still were being implemented. We had a second reading, and we still had some minor changes going in, or at least one minor change. I know there are some things that were not addressed this time. Uh, and I'm specifically thinking of Jude because it was a very valid point that you made about the pro uh, proxy voting. Uh, we will review uh, next year the bylaws again. So what has not made the, the, the corrections or the, the things you want to see in the bylaws that hasn't made it into it this time will definitely be in there next, next year. So I intend to do it in the spring before we even start all the uh, home and garden shows and all that so that we truly have every year the bylaws reviewed and revised as we should. Um, again, as Kelly said, we are going to start the handbook for the manual for policies, procedures, and job descriptions. And when you see discrepancies right now, just like we have pointed out, that also will be uh, taken care of so that we go into revision and review next year for the bylaws. Those discrepancies will also be solved. So with this, today is the day to vote, and I hope they will be voted in. So we have brand new current bylaws to, to work by. Thank you. With that, I've launched the, it, um, the poll, uh, which in effect is a, is a vote, if you will. So it, uh, it's a single choice you know, that you're allowed to make here. You can uh, vote to accept or to approve. You can vote to reject. Um, you can choose to abstain. You know, and that's fine too. You know, that's just that's uh, there's no um, there's no stress in terms of the the uh, the, um, um, the bylaws say that a quorum for these sorts of votes is the uh, is the whomever is, is here. So it um, you know it's not a uh, it's not a stress in terms of um, uh, okay. in terms of who all is here. Okay, thank you, Kelly. That's important to know. Yeah. Okay. So we'll leave it open for a little bit. It should be a simple uh, point and uh, point and and uh, and vote here. Um, there's a uh, question for you, Kelly. This is for this is about the bylaws, which refer to the foundation. So these are foundation members. Is that correct? That is correct. So foundation members. So I, I don't think Dr. Fry would be at, uh, you know, will be voting. <laughs> and I'm not that uh, I'm not too concerned about uh, at, um, uh, at, um, uh, uh, you know, corrupt voting practices. I think we can. Uh, and so clearly we had, um, you know, at, uh, this is that uh, already with the 16 votes we have here, by the way, 16 per, uh, people have uh, responded, 17 people have responded and 17 are all saying uh, we vote to accept. Uh, the, uh, that is the clear majority of the uh, of the twenty members, the twenty members that are on the uh, on the call here this morning. So it, um, you know, I'll leave it at the, I'll leave it at that, and I'll end the poll, and it, uh, you know, and we'll share the results, you know, and it. Uh, so you should be able to see that the full results here, and so the record can show is that um, here on September thirteenth, right, you know. Uh, we have it, um, you know, 17 yes votes and one that uh, nay uh, vote, um, you know, and out of the 20 folks that uh, are on the uh, on the call here, um, and uh, um, and just because I'm I actually am uh, hosting the the call, I was not able to actually participate in the vote myself. So that would mean that there's just a, there's really just one other person that didn't vote um, uh, on the call here today. So Sabine, you've got it. You know, I think you've got your at. Um, you know, you've got your, we've got the, the, the bylaws approved here and, and ready I to move. Like, yeah. may, I, may I interrupt you? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, no, we're good. We're good. Okay. All done. I want to thank you for the vote. I want to thank you for um, um, honoring the work that the committee did because it was hard work and it was at times quite tedious, I have to say. So I want to thank all of you for recognizing the work which was done by the committee to get us to the point to move forward with brand new uh, revised bylaws and um, also for your trust that whatever may need still need to be changed will be done. We will take care of the things that may still um, uh, concern you. 
And in the meantime, I truly appreciate you for your vote and for um, allowing all of us to move forward. Thank you. Very good. Now, another big discussion we're going to have at the at, um, at the board meeting following is a discussion about meetings, at, uh, about foundation meetings. Yeah. Uh, we've his historically, of course, have met here on Tuesday mornings uh, since time immemorial. And it, uh, there's quite a bit of discussion now with respect to new cohorts of members who are working and find it inconvenient to make it uh, to make it this time. So it, um, we want to keep continuing uh, the discussion regarding uh, when and where and how we might want to continue to meet. So that discussion will pick up at our board meeting. It'll be forthcoming. And it, um, you know, I wanted to uh, uh, lead quickly then into the, the, the key part of today's presentation with with Melissa. And it uh, and the presentation here on it uh, on life in the slow lane because it uh, this is of course that uh, uh, Melissa I know one of the first questions that we're going to be asking is your backstory I mean how does anyone you know how does anyone get interested in this you know enough to pursue this so that you actually do you know focus on this entire you know section of the zoological spectrum um, so this will be a fun one I also want to do a quick shout out by the way to OSU uh, you know they have a slug portal at Oregon State University. And it, uh, you know, and it, uh, and so it, uh, if you can, you can, you know, OSU slug portal, you can Google and it, uh, you'll actually come up to it, uh, an entire, you know, array of information on it, uh, on that, uh, you know, on, on slugs and snails. So with, with that as a shout out here at, uh, I'm going to stop sharing and Melissa, turn it over to you. Great. I will, uh, attempt to, sh uh, share my screen here. Is that showing up on your end? We see it. We see the PowerPoint, not the slideshow, but we do see the PowerPoint. Okay, let's see. Here. And that's fine. How's that? Now we got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kelly, for uh, inviting me. It's uh, a wonderful opportunity to speak with all of you. So uh, Kelly had asked me to come and give a kind of a brief overview of the snails and slugs living in Washington and the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so I'm going to just give a, a overview of just some of the more conspicuous and interesting species of terrestrial snails and slugs that live here, but with an emphasis on Western Washington. Uh, and I'm also going to share a little bit information about how you can capture observances about their distributions and abundances through community science projects that we have going. And then I'm hoping if we have enough time in the Q&A that we could chat about some public messaging. So I'm sure you have lots of questions about um, introduced species and what constitutes a uh, pest and what to do about them. So I hope I can answer some of those questions. Uh, so as you know, the Pacific Northwest region is renowned for its diversity, but also its diversity in land, snails, and slugs. So in Washington alone, we have approximately 130 species. That really surprises a lot of people. Uh, the majority of these are snails that have a coiled shell, and that makes up about 80% of those 130 species. But the Pacific Northwest region is really well known for their slugs. As you can see here, there's lots of different types of slugs. Um, I'm sure many of them, many of them you run into in your gardens. There are many shelled species that are very, very, very tiny. Sometimes you might see those. Uh, anything less than five millimeters, we count as micro gastropods. And that makes up about 30% of those 130 species. And then there's unfortunately a relatively large portion that have been introduced from other parts of the world, uh, about somewhere between 18 and 20%. And collectively, these snails and slugs are found in a variety of habitats, not just in our gardens, but also in wet coastal forests, all the way up to dry talus slopes in the eastern Washington. Okay, so in addition to this amazing diversity, one of the reasons that I'm interested in terrestrial gastropods, and Kelly had asked, um, had mentioned that, you know, how do you even get in, interested in this? Um, my background is quickly, uh, I have a background in broadly in invertebrate zoology. I worked mainly in marine systems. I've worked with 
primarily mollusks, but also other invertebrates. But uh, since moving to the Pacific Northwest, um, probably about 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago now, uh, I recognized quickly that there's such a diversity in terrestrial gastropods, and that includes the snails and slugs. So I started uh, kind of from an amateur perspective, other than the fact that I am a professional biologist, but my training is not in snails and slugs, land snails and slugs. So everything that I'm teaching you here today is things that I have had to learn over the last 20 years. Um, I'm really interested in them because I find them captivating and, ex and some of you may disagree with this, but I find them extraordinarily charming. So I'm gonna just play a little video. It's about three to four minutes long. It hopefully captures a little bit about the natural history in general. Um, looking at this one particular species, which is called the brown garden snail. It is an introduced species here in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm sure many of you have seen it. Let's see here. So um, this is a common resident that we often will see in our gardens and neighborhoods, and it's the one with the brown shell uh, that has kind of some slight markings on it. This particular species does feed on plant material. So some of you, some of you might actually not appreciate it. They have a radula, just like uh, the gastropods that live in the marine systems. They have a radula, which is like a long tongue that they use to feed. And they also use these retractable tentacles, both upper tentacles and lower tentacles, not just to see. They don't see images. They see um, light and, and shadows but they use it to navigate their environment through chemo and touch. And they glide around in their foot. Uh, they produce a mucus trail. That's how they find each other. And one thing that's really interesting about these guys, or uh, I should say they're hermaphrodites, is that they're both male and female. Uh, they typically though do not self-fertilize, but they rather copulate with each other, so they find another mate. And they spend hours uh, nipping, biting, and firing these things called love darts, which is really interesting. Uh, they spear each other with these little darts before the actual copulation event takes place. And the dart is made of calcium carbonate, which is the same as the shell, but different species have different love darts. So this particular species um, has a love dart that it delivers a chemical that influences sperm survival. So the reproductive organ, which you're going to see in just a little bit here, actually emerges from behind the head, as you can see right there, the averted atrium. And the individuals will align themselves one next to another, and they then swap sperm, as you can see here, that's what they're doing. The sperm then travels internally to fertilize the egg. So fertilization is internal. And then this is what's surprising. Once inside, the mate tries to destroy or digest the other sperm before it reaches their eggs. And this is a very curious tactic. Um, it allows them to mate with and, and share their sperm with their prospective mate. But they try to um, destroy the sperm because they accept and storm, store sperm from multiple partners. So they try to limit the amount of sperm from a single mate. So this love dart that you see here is actually the purpose of it is to increase the chance that the sperm survives. Uh, mates that successfully fire a love dart increases their chance of passing their genes on to the next generation. And once they successfully mate, they lay their eggs into the soil. And after a few weeks of development, these little tiny offspring hatch and then they emerge into the world. So that's just kind of like a very general overview about natural history in uh, garden snails. But many of that, those same ideas, let's see here, this isn't, there we go, uh, apply to other species. So I'm just gonna start out with um, the introduced snails because those are the ones that you are probably most familiar with. 
Uh, in addition to the garden snail, which is pictured here on the upper left, we also have a conspicuously colorful and banded grove snail. Uh, this, range, the, this species range in a number of color pattern, colors and patterns. And then we also have the smaller glass snails that are aptly named because you can actually see through their shells. These again are the ones that we find in typically in our backyards and in our gardens and in our neighborhoods, urban parks, but unfortunately we're also starting to see them in more remote areas. Like I mentioned, they're non-native. They have been introduced inadvertently, not, not on purpose, and largely um, they were introduced through the movement of plants. And this is something that happened uh, Many of them, many of these introductions happened historically, you know, up to 100 years ago. Most of these particular snails are herbivores or detritivores, so they feed on plants or decaying plants, and many of them you might consider pests. But I do want to point out that these make up relatively few of all of the um, shelled snails in Washington, and not all snails, land snails, are created equal in this respect. So we have a number of native species. And once we get away from the urban areas and into the moist forest, we start to find these native species. So in the interest of time, I'm only going to focus on the most common species that live here in Western Washington. Uh, this one is called the Pacific Sideban. Many of you may have seen them as you're walking through the forests over in the Olympic National Park or in the surrounding area. They are characterized by this unique band that runs along the side of their chocolate colored shell. And the other thing that's really interesting and unique about them is they have a very salmon, bright red salmon colored body. It's the largest native land snail in the Pacific Northwest. The shell gets to be about an uh, inch and a half wide. And I used to live in British Columbia. Um, and in BC, it was previously listed as a species of special concern. So they are in some places becoming exceedingly rare or rarer. In Washington state though, there is no protected status and that's similar to all, all land snails. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. This one is the Northwest Hesperian, which is quite common also in the forests of the Pacific Northwest, but many people overlook it because um, a lot of these animals are more active at night. Um, and so during the day, in order to find them, one of the best places to look is to look under things like logs and debris, woody debris and rocks. Uh, this photo shows the hairs on its what we call a periostracum, which is really just this tiny, thin, organic layer that's made out of chitin. It's the same um, material that's, uh, that's connected to that. It's the outermost layer of the shell. So this hairy periostracum is really what sets the species apart. There's uh, at least one other species, uh, Cryptomastis that also has a hairy periostracum, but it is not as common and the hairs are not as dense. There is some variation within uh, some of the species, hairy to hairless, but in general, most of them are hairy and they're very, very, very cute. And then the next group, which is perhaps one of my favorite groups, um, is are the lance tooths. And I call them the tremas because the genera are the haplotrema and the oncotrema. They're characterized by having a golden shell that's rather smooth, and uh, the beaded lance tooth has tiny, minute beads on it. But uh, apart from their kind of unremarkable shell, one of the ways that you can identify a lance tooth is by its touch or bite. You can put these things out onto your hand and give it some time, and as they start to feed, um, you will feel their tooth. They have a radula, that feeding structure that I mentioned, that has uh, evolved into a piercing structure, and it feels like a little bit of a needle prick, which tells us that these animals are not grazers. They are not feeding on your plants. They, they are predators on other terrestrial gastropods. So again, not all uh, land snails are the same. And then finally, uh, I'm just going to point out, this is called an Oregon forest snail. 
This has a big brown shell with a recurved lip on that outer lip, but the, uh, the periostracum can sometimes flake off as seen here, revo revealing a chalky white shell. Now these snails can be really, really patchy in their distribution and, and abundance. And in places like British Columbia, the species is considered rare enough that it is red listed, meaning that isn't considered endangered. In Washington, where it is found, um, and that's particularly forests with big leaf maples that have springs and seeps and a lot of stinging nettle for its food. It really does seem to thrive, but those habitats are few and far between. And in places where I have seen them, they've been very abundant, but it's not very common to run into them. So it's an important example of how important it is to protect places that are home to species with very specific habitat requirements. So the, apart from the introduced snails and slug slide, all of these other ones that I've shown you, unless you are gardening in a forest or live right back up um, against some natural areas, you're typically not going to find these as your garden pests. These are going to be the ones that are out on the trails and in the adjacent natural habitats. So um, I'm just going to move on to, let's see here. There we go. My computer seems to freeze up every once in a while. So um, I'm going to move on to slugs and a common question that I get asked is what a, is a slug and I'm sure many of you know what a slug is. But the, the best way to answer that when you're talking to the public is that a slug is essentially a gastropod that has lost its shell or has a highly reduced shell. Um, so banana slugs are the most iconic slugs here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, indeed, it's perhaps what I would argue one of the most iconic invertebrates of our Pacific Northwest forests. They vary in color from blonde, as you can see up here on the top, to uh, bright yellow, uh, resembling a, a ripe banana, to olive green, to spotty, uh, to all black which is, I consider the overripe banana. They are large. And so many people see them. Uh, in fact, you often, you know, are tripping over them in the, in the, on the trail. It's the second largest slug in the world and it can reach up to 10 inches when extended. So the thing that allows us to identify this as a banana slug is that it has a very strong keel that extends most of the length of its shell, of its tail. And by that, I mean there's this ridge along the back end of its tail, right in the middle that you can see, and it kind of looks like a keel of a boat. So we call that a keel. And banana slugs are one of the few species that have a really strong keel. They are found, as you know, in moist forests throughout uh, Western Washington, and they are less common on the Eastern slopes of the um, Cascades. Now, because slugs have lost their shells, they have had to evolve alternative defenses. And banana slugs, as you probably also know, produce copious amounts of mucus or slime, which is a brilliant solution for many problems. It allows them to glide around on their foot easily, but it also is a huge deterrent to predators. However, it's not fail-proof. And as a result, uh, there are other slugs that have evolved additional defense mechanisms that are uh, endemic here to the Pacific Northwest. These are the tail droppers that some of you may have heard of. Uh, it, this entire genus, Prophyseon, is native to the Pacific Northwest. Now, what's interesting about these tail droppers is, with, as the name implies, they're similar to reptiles or amphibians that can self-amputate. So they are remarkable for their ability to drop their tails when faced with a, pred a predator. Now, importantly, they can also regenerate their tail. As you can see here, um, I think in the third photo down, about half, about a third of the back end of the tail, you can see a slight constriction uh, line that was from a previous amputation, and then the animal has grown its tail back. The four most common species are the reticulate, the blue-gray, the yellow bordered and the scarlet back tail dropper, although there's six species within Washington 
And one thing that I just want to point out is that the blue gray tail dropper is is very difficult to find. I've actually never seen it in Washington. I've only seen it in British Columbia. And it was recently listed in the past few years as a candidate for being listed as at risk in Washington state. Now, I'm not sure if that has eventually gone through. The second group that's uh, unique to the Pacific Northwest are the jumping slugs. Oh. And uh, yeah, they, they, we have slugs that jump or what I like to uh, refer to, they are flopping slugs because they have this unique behavior that when they also are threatened by predators, they will coil up and straighten out repeatedly in rapid succession. And some people consider that their jump or their hop. Um, it sometimes to me looks like a little bit of a flop. Uh, the idea here is that they are most likely trying to break the slime trail that the predator is following to detect them. The two most common species are the warty jumping slug, which is very, very small and has a, that has a relatively large papillose mantle here. You can see all the bumps on the mantle. They have a, it has a very short tail. And then the dromedary jumping slug, which is characterized by having a, what we call a caudal horn at the tail, that the tip of its tail. There's actually four species in Washington. Uh, and both of these species, these pictures here, I hope you can see it, but all of the jumping slugs have a, a reduced shell that's embedded still in the mantle. And the mantle um, kind of um, envelopes that, that shell. Okay, and then finally, the introduced slugs, which make up a whopping 43% of all slug species in Washington. So these are the species that you are likely seeing around your neighborhoods, in your garden, in urban parks, in urban areas. But increasingly, we are starting to see them in more remote areas too, which is interesting. So I've only picked out the most common. There's actually, I believe, 12 uh, or 13, 12 species of introduced slug here in Washington state. The top two, the leopard slug and the yellow slug look very similar to each other. Uh, they both have are characterized by having these spots um, on their mantle and along their tail. But one of the things that allows you to identify one versus the other is the color of the tentacles. You can see in the leopard slug, they have a reddish head and red tentacles, whereas in the yellow slugs, they have kind of a steely blue head with bluish tentacles. The next group is the Arions, and that is the genus Arion. Those are the, um, there's many species of Arions that have been introduced here. They can be very difficult to tell apart. I always refer to a key. There are six species in Washington, including this chocolate or black Arion. There's actually two species that have been introduced. You cannot tell them apart unless you re dissect them. Uh, and um, those are the ones that we're starting to see in remote areas, like you know, up the, the trail that leads up the Ho River Valley, um, which brings up an important question about how they, they are getting dispersed. Um, the one thing that is interesting about them is that they, let's see, they can sometimes be confused with a black, the black Arions can be confused with a black banana slug. But again, remember about that keel and the banana slug, Arions don't have a keel. What they do have are these uneven tubercles that, uh, that you can see on, that run along their tail. The next group is the Duroceros. There's about three or four species. One is actually native to the Pacific Northwest, the meadow slug. The other ones are introduced. They are characterized by having a concentric folds that run along their mantle. It looks almost like a fingerprint. Uh, and you can see that here in the leftmost picture. And then finally, uh, we have the um, shelled slug, which is interesting because you hardly ever see it. In fact, I've only seen two in my entire life. They live subterranean, they feed on earthworms, and they too have a highly reduced shell that just is at the very, very top tip of their um, end of their tail. 
every once in a while they will come out sometimes after a heavy rain they will emerge and people sometimes find them and they're so striking in their color they're bright yellow often um, or bright white and so people report them again they don't feed on your garden they feed on earthworms though then there's two species that I haven't shown here that are more recently introduced, the ambigolemex, which is called the three-banded garden slug. Here in Seattle, I have seen a real um, explosion in their populations, at least in my neighborhood. Uh, a couple years ago, I never saw this species, and now my entire garden is filled up with them. And then there's also something called a worm slug, which also is subterranean and lives underground also not found typically in gardens, but is found um, becoming more increasingly common in and around Seattle. And we are actually just publishing a paper now about the worm slug um, in Washington state. So in general, uh, I would say that slugs live very similar lives as the snails, with the exception of some of the distinctive defensive strategies that I talked about. But they also have elaborate courtship behaviors that rival those love darts that we saw in the snails. Now, I failed to mention that one of the, in, in certain species of the banana slugs, which is, this is one of the um, interesting aspects of their natural history, is that they practice a, a apophilation, which is the act of biting off the penis of their mate following copulation. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer the question, uh, answer why that is, but I wanted to um, go on and show you this video of another uh, slug, the leopard slug, which as I um, just pointed out in one of the previous slides, that this is one of the introduce slugs that's commonly found in the Pacific Northwest, and it might be something that you see regularly in your neighborhoods. So um, this is just a short video showing the, the copulation behavior. Um, the prospective mates will find each other using those slime trails that they leave behind. And they, once they find each other, they will head upwards, often for a branch on a tree that's high up. Um, I've seen them dangling from garages. The prospective mates um, will entwine themselves and wind themselves around each other. And this can continue for quite some time. Eventually, they slide down a, a thread of mucus as you can see here, and dangle from that thread of mucus. And they continue to dangle until they are ready to evert their reproductive organs. Again, it comes right out from behind their heads. And as the organs grow longer and longer, and it, sometimes they, the organs themselves can reach the um, length of their entire body. And then those reproductive organs will start to entwine and fan out until they are ready to transfer sperm from one mate to another. So this happens um, again over the course of, uh, it, can, it can take place over the course of hours and it happens at night. So you have to be outside at nighttime looking for these things. Hey. It does get reported from time to time. Hi. Um, it's not because and so they will they will mate and then once they are finished mating they will retract their reproductive organs and then simply go plunk and fall to the ground so that's just the last um bit of, let's see here, uh, overview of the snails and slugs. And I just wanted to, let's see, how are we doing on time? Just very quickly go through um, information about, for those of you who are seriously interested in snails and slugs, um, how you can 
make your own observations. So the good news is that you don't have to be fast to catch them. Uh, you don't have to get up early, which is awesome for people like me. You don't have to stalk them in the summer heat or in the winter cold. Uh, and you can start looking in any natural area. So depending on the species, they do associate with a wide variety of different substrates. So again, you can find them in your gardens or in your parks. Um, in, the, in the forests, I like to look in places like Western sword fern, skunk cabbage, leaf litter, uh, associated with fungi often. So check out your mushrooms under logs, under rocks or on stones. Uh, the rock and stone is a very good source of calcium for them to be building their shells. The one thing that all snails and slugs need is moisture. So they will often be found in microhabitats that allow them to conserve water and resist desiccation. And as I somewhat alluded to already, they are most active at night and during the spring and fall. So during the summer and in the winter, they go through estivation or in hibernation. And, you know, you can, uh, there are some field guides if you're really interested in keying these things out, the best ones that are available here, uh, in addition to that resource that Kelly mentioned through the Oregon Department of Agriculture website, there's some really fantastic photos um, and keys, online keys. In addition, there's the book by Thomas Burke, Land Snails and Slugs of the Pacific Northwest, and one for British Columbia that has a lot of overlap in species written by Robert Forsyth. Uh, you, having a hand lens is good to be able to look at shell structure. If you're interested in collecting, which I don't always recommend, particularly because there's a lot of species that are rare, but if, if it's something that, you know, you, for whatever reason, scientific reason, if you're leading a study, um, you need things like vials and preservation fluids if you're sampling. And then of course, a camera with a good macro lens can be very, very ha handy. Uh, now that said, um, you don't have to have an SLR camera. Many of our iPhones and um, cell phones have very, very good macro cameras on them that I've started using on a more regular basis. So one of the things that I'm trying to encourage people to do who are interested in snails and slugs is documenting and sharing your observations. And fortunately, there is an app for that. And iNaturalist, which many of you have heard of, I'm sure, is an online platform and social network that allows us to map our the observations of biodiversity. And this isn't just snails and slugs. You can do plants, anything that is a wild, um, non-cultivated plant, animal, or fungi. The platform was developed uh, between Cal Academy, Cal Academy and National Geographic. Its primary goal is to collect uh, collect information about biodiversity observations, but also to connect to the public and get a real community of participants that are interested in nature um, connected to one another. And of course, the data that comes out of this has been uh, remarkable to researchers. It's imagine instead of being able, instead of having to go out and survey you know, all over the state of Washington, we have thousands and thousands of participants that are logging their observations. So researchers have been able to use this openly shared crowdsourced data, making it one of the largest platforms for community science and conservation projects to tap into. So this is what the iNaturalist website looks like. Um, all of these red dots represent observations that are made by participants and then the some of the more recent records. Um, this is a screenshot from many, from many days ago. Everything from insects to plants to animals, fungi. Um, to make an observation, it's pretty straightforward. You snap a photo, you provide an identification and a location and date. And if you're using a mobile device, you don't even have to provide a location and date because your mobile device automatically geo-references and dates the tagged um, image. And then all of that metadata is uploaded along with the photo. And the other thing that's really becoming useful, and I'm surprised at how effective and accurate it is, is that 
iNaturalist has built in AI, artificial intelligence technology, that helps advert observers identify their own observations. So even though yeah, in 10 years ago, I would have um, been here talking to you about how to identify snails and slugs and teaching you all of the traits, just like plants, snails and slugs have unique traits that allow us to identify them down to species. But with iNaturalist, you can simply submit the photo and get it down to the lowest ID that you think is possible submit it, and then a community of naturalists are able to weigh in. The, I, the AI actually is remarkably good at identifying it down to species, but if it gets it wrong, there's an entire community of naturalists out there that are able to weigh in and further improve the identification. So there's many projects that are using iNaturalist um, as a platform to compile data and foster engagement. And I'm just going to mention this, um, project here called SLIME, which stands for Snail and Slugs Living in Metropolitan em Environments, which was developed by Jan Vendetti at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And the goal here was to catalog the biodiversity of land snails and slugs in Southern California, uh, especially the LA area, which is not a place that you really expect to or think about of having a high diversity of land snails and slugs. But much to their surprise, they were able to document 139 species, I think they were up to um, after this screenshot. And it, that includes five introduced species that have never been recorded. And that's all from community scientists. I think she had over 2,500 part participants that were engaged in that project. So uh, we, we uh, looked at that project and realized how successful it was and um, decided to follow its lead. And we recently launched Slime Pacific Northwest, which it also aims to chronicle the presence and distribution of land snails and slugs in the Pacific Northwest region. And that includes British Columbia, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. And the project is in collaboration with Jan down at the LA County Natural History Museum, as well as um, Casey Richer at Oregon State University. So the project will compile observation records that are shared on iNaturalist. So if any of you take pictures of snails and slugs roaming around your gardens or in nearby parks or forests, um, those will be captured by this project. And uh, just within the last year that we have been using this, we've been able to de detect an introduced species, that worm slug that I mentioned, that was previously unreported in Seattle, but now has been detected at at least four localities, three in Seattle and one surprisingly in Bonnie Lake. So we're now discovering that this species is much more widespread than originally thought. And the goal here is that overall, um, after some time, we hope that we'll have a much better idea of which species are present in the region to track the arrival of new introduced species, um, get a better idea of the distribution of each species, look at range movements, um, understand relative abundances, what's rare, what's common, and then even think about habitat associations. So how can you get involved? Um, if you're interested, you can obviously join iNaturalist. If you haven't already, you can join for free. Um, there is a separate um, uh, program called SEEK for anybody who is um, not interested in sharing any identifying information if you don't want to set up an account. It's also really good to get kids involved using the SEEK app um, because there are no identifying, um, uh, you don't have to have an account and, and you can just use it and go around and take pictures and the AI, AI will help you identify it. And again, even if you don't want to do snails and slugs, that's fine, you, you know, you can walk around um, your neighborhood or your forest and, and take pictures of plants. Um, and then once, if you have joined iNaturalist, you can join the slime project. Uh, and let's see how do you either by, um, clicking on the site, this link down below, or the other option is to go to the tab in iNaturalist that's above says, that says community and scroll down to projects and then type in slime Pacific Northwest. 
and then just uh, click on that page and then you can become a member, add yourself as a member. And then finally, I, I haven't talked much about the new Burke, um, which is actually at this point, although it still feels new, is becoming the old Burke. Um, we opened in the fall of 2019. And of course the pandemic um, changed our plans, but we have been open for the past few years. If you haven't been by, I encourage you to come and visit, check out our exhibits. Um, we hope to be leading more community science and education projects that are connected to Slime Pacific Northwest uh, at the Burke, and that might involve um, uh, walks out in parks and places like that. So definitely um, come by, swing by, and keep yourself informed by going to the website. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. I'm sure there's lots of questions about um, how to message um, some of this information to the public, but I'm happy to answer any questions about natural history as well. Melissa, this has just been fascinating, right, with respect to the details here. I don't know if you want to take a peek at the chat in terms sure. of some of the questions that have been uh, posted and some of the comments, but while you're doing that, Rhonda, you have your hand up. You want to yeah. share your question? Hey, I got to unmute myself first. Um, you might have said this, and I, between writing notes, maybe I missed it, but you talked about how they have both male and female reproductive parts. So when they copulate together, do they both become impregnated and they both will lay more eggs so that we have dual things going on there? Twice as many yeah. eggs being laid? Yeah, so I think that's their point. That's their hope. Uh, so, um, you know, it's actually a pretty efficient system if you're thinking at it, thinking about it from a uh, population perspective. And it might explain a lot when you get these exploding populations, uh, you know, that just really, because they can be quite productive. So every time a mating takes place, if they do, in fact, each individual shares its sperm with its prospective mate, fertilization can be taking place in each of those individuals. But remember, wow. there's some <laughs> that don't want that to happen. They, they want to share their sperm, but they don't necessarily always, um, the strategy isn't always to become inseminated. And the reason for that, they think, and I don't study this, but from what I've read, at least in certain species, like those that you've lo used love darts in the snails, and there's a couple of them that use love darts, actually quite a few, um, as well as things like the banana slug that, that chew their mate's penis off at, at the, you know, um, there is a, a real attempt to um, sort of influence uh, the success of reproduction. So the love dart produces a chemical that um, will make sure that their sperm survives because otherwise their mate internally will be trying to destroy their sperm. And the reason for that wow. is because they've already mated with another individual and they want that for whatever reason, that is the, the sperm that has already inseminated them. So there's sperm competition going on. And I think that they're still probably trying to figure out a little of the details, but the idea behind the love darts is to influence the success of mating. And if they, if they don't have those love darts, then there's a good chance that even though they might get fertilized, they may not be successful of passing their um, genes on again with their, their prospective mate. So. Thank you. So very I hope that, fascinating. I hope that was clear. It's very complicated and very unusual. Um, and so it's sometimes hard to understand exactly what's going on. And it, like I said, researchers are still studying this and trying to understand the, the mechanics and the chemistry of it and the behavior um, and what gets selected for and selected against. So um, I'll run through the chat. Um, someone asked who gets credit for the name of Love Dart and I do not know, but um, it's, 
it, you know, they, they look like darts for sure. And I think actually one time I read on, I'm not so sure if this is true, but um, there is some connection to Cupid there. And so um, uh, it might have come from the, the, that whole Cupid idea. But, but that really is a technical term, right? The love dart yes, is the technical that is, term. That is okay. the technical term. If you said love dart to a, someone who studies land snails, they would know exactly what you were talking about. And I mentioned, you know, I brought it up in the brown snail has love darts, but so does the grove snail, that other introduced species. And I was surprised to find out that the Pacific sideband also produces love darts. So even some of our native species has it. It's not confined to just certain groups or lineages. Um, there's, it's, it's common throughout, uh, common enough throughout land snails and there's a real diversity in the type of darts, you know, like there was that picture that showed you all the different types of darts, shapes and structures. Um, okay, so should we be especially concerned about non-native species? Do they impact the ecosystem in especially noxious ways? Um, so non-native species, Kelly, I'm, I'm assuming you are asking the question of, are non-native species pests? Yeah, yeah. When, we, well, when yeah. we normally think about, you know, invasive species and non-native, we're always concerned about them taking over habitat and out, you know, and outpacing yeah. or out, out reproducing the natives. And so yeah. is that, is that, is the same, or do we have the same concerns here with snails and slugs? Yeah, so that's a really good question because there's a lot of discussion about, you know, what is the, the term invasive? You know, invasive, we often use it synonymously with introduced, but there are native species that can be invasive, as many of you probably know that applies to certain plants. But in terms of the non, the, um, uh, in terms of non-native species, um, I would say that we should be concerned in places like, well, you're concerned in your gardens, <laughs> but there are like that Arion species that I mentioned, the black Arion or the chocolate Arion, it is being found in areas that are um, really, really remote. And we know that because of iNaturalist, because people are in these remote areas taking pictures and what seemingly seems like pristine areas. And whether or not they are competing or out competing with um, the native species like banana slug remains unknown. There's just been no work that has been done on that. The one thing I will say, and this is completely um, just based on, you know, random observations is that there are, uh, you know, I camp a lot. And when we go camping, we at nighttime, we'll go out and look for snails and slugs and document what's there. And when we are able to find native species in places like campgrounds, particularly car camping campgrounds, we're seeing a lot of non-natives. Okay. And so how far they go remains unclear, but we are starting to see them in places like the ho the trail that you know look at iNaturalist and you can see that the Arion, that black and chocolate slug is getting all the way up the Ho River Trail. Like we're not talking just the visitor center and the parking lot. We're talking five miles in. And um, you know, they they do move, not necessarily fast, um, but they do move and they probably cover some ground over from year to year. And, you know, there just hasn't been a lot done in terms of their ecological impacts, but, um, you know, it's hard to imagine them not having some impact. It's just a matter of how impactful that, that is. Um, you know, I know we often villainize non-native species. Um, I, I kind of have a, a mixed feelings about it. You know, I know people who, when they see non-native species, the first thing they want to do is kill them. And I actually don't subscribe to that because, um, partly because I feel that, you know, biodiversity has enough, um, 
issues going on in, in some of the places that they are showing up, there's, there's nothing left there anyways. And so these are filling an ecological niche that would have previously been filled by a native species. Um, it's just in those areas where they're both present, that's really hard to figure out what, what's going on and what to do. In your gardens, uh, people always ask me, what do I do about the snails and slugs in my garden? I guarantee you that the thing, the species that you see in your garden are non-native. Um, I have never seen a native species in any of the urban areas in Seattle, apart from in the parks. So unless you're gardening in a, in a city park, you're not seeing native species. But the question about what to do about them is, you know, I, I, I encourage people to figure out what they want to do on um, what they emotionally can do. Uh, I, I don't like to kill things. And so I'm, you know, I think that, um, well, I mean, I can give you an example of not for snails and slugs, but, you know, this summer I grew kale I know is not the best time in the year to grow kale, but I grew kale and it didn't do very well because I had cabbage white caterpillars all over it. And so I decided that I needed to change my thinking and that I wasn't growing kale, that I was growing cabbage whites. And I loved seeing the cabbage whites in our garden when they would emerge and become butterflies. And I even liked the caterpillars. And now that they've starting to move on, you know, my kale is starting to grow back. And um, yes, it kind of took a beating this summer, but it will do fine. And so I, I don't know. I mean, there's no answer to this. And I encourage people to figure out what they, what they want to do. But I think that, you know, we, we need to sometimes um, not think about all of the animals that are destroying our plants as pests, whether they're native or not and try to allow for some of them also to live on this planet with us. That would be my biggest message. And in terms of what to do in places that are getting overrun by non-natives, you know, where there are removal programs, um, they haven't been very successful, <laughs> particularly when they're invertebrates. And so um, I think that's why there's, there's a bit of a change in the discussion about in, in the invasion biology world about what to do about introduced or invasive species. Um, that might not be the answer that people are looking for, but that's kind of the answer that I've arrived at after you know, two decades of working in areas of invertebrate biology and working on invasive species, particularly in marine habitats. Um, Another question is how uh, curious as to how habitat dependent these various species are. That's a great question. Some of them are extremely habitat dependent, meaning that, you know, like the Oregon forest snail that I mentioned, and some of the um, jumping slugs and, and tail droppers, I only find them in certain species, in certain areas, certain um, forests. Uh, I mentioned the requirements for the Oregon forest snail for the tail droppers and jumping slugs. I have found them, my best luck has been in really old forests. So over on the Olympic Peninsula, um, not just, um, you know, on, in the Olympic National Forest, there have been places down near Quinault that I've been hiking through. And then all of a sudden I walked through a patch where all of a sudden it felt very moist and dark. And I thought this look, this is exactly the kind of place that a jumping slug would be found and started to look for them and found um, the warty. And so there is something about these microhabitats um, that they, that certain species really need. Um, they, it, you know, they're not just gonna be in any forest, it's a certain type of forest. Um, and that's probably what makes some of the native species rare and why we should be conserving and protecting a variety of different types of forests, not just you know, tracks that have been clear cutted and then grown back as tree farms. Um, that's not gonna cut it for our native species. They won't survive in places like that. Um, uh, 
the 43% of all species being non-native, those are just for slugs, Kelly, just the, the slugs. Um, if you look at all of the gastropods in general for terrestrials, it's it's 18%, but that 43% suggests that that's where most of, like most of the non-natives are slugs. Um, how different anatomy or physiology wise are these from each other? You know, again, um, some of them like the Arions, there's a there's like four to six species within the Arions and then another four of Durosaurus that are introduced. So within those groups, within those genera, they're gonna be really, really similar to one another. And the fact that many of them you know, are living in places like our gardens and they're all kind of taking up um, similar roles like the Durosaurus and um, that three-banded garden slug, those are gonna be very similar to one another. The Arions are typically found in forests. They might be slightly, have different habitat requirements. And then the things like the, uh, that shelled ear slug um, and the worm slugs, those are subterraneans. So those are also going to be very, very different uh, ecologically, physiology. They're going to be very different. Um, I don't know about mood music. <laughs> um, I'm glad people are enjoying the, the videos. Um, how unique are these courtship reproductive habits across the animal kingdom? I would say very unique. And um, you know, especially with the hermaphroditic um, strategy and the courtship rituals and behaviors are really, really unique. Um, we don't even see that kind of weird courtship and mating behaviors in gastropods and marine systems. Um, so I like to use these as a kind of an entry point to get people excited about how cool these animals are because they do something really unusual. Um, and it also dispels this myth that they're gross and icky and creepy. Um, some of these animals are doing absolutely beautiful uh, things and they're very cool. And I want people to appreciate them as animals in their own right. So yeah, the crowdsource data is academically valuable for sure. Uh, we expect to use some of it to answer some questions about introduced species and also rare species. And I'm talking to Casey um, Reichert down at OSU about that right now. So Kathy asked, can you discuss how the tentacles besides sensing light and dark and tactile stimuli provide information with chemoreceptors? Um, oh yeah. And so I don't know that much about the details of it. I just know that their upper tentacles are used to, um, sense, uh, images, not images, but sorry, the light dark. And then the lower tentacles are what they using for touch tactile stimuli, and, um, also picking up chemical scent, um, signals. And so I don't know that much about the the physiology of that or the chemistry of that. But what I do know is that since they cannot see very well, that they are really relying on the chemo sensory system. Uh, and that allows them to find each other, so for mating, but it also allows many species like the lance tooths to find their, their prey. Because remember, that's a species that's predatory and they're feeding on other land snails and slugs. And so they're finding them not by looking at them, but they're sensing the chemical and following that slime trail. So here's a really good question about rat lungworm. <clears throat> and I don't know how many of you have heard of rat lungworm. It's a, uh, it's a parasite. It's a nematode that lives in snails and slugs, uh, primarily in places in Southeast Asia, um, Africa, South America, but has been reported in Hawaii, Australia, and Florida, and perhaps other places in the Southeast of the United States. I think maybe even in California. Yeah, I think um, maybe I'm Oregon. sorry. 
And Oregon is Oregon too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that probably, that makes sense because there's a lot of people doing pest work in Oregon and um, it's a nematode. It's the snails and slugs are a, um, what they're not the, the, um, what's the worm word? Um, they are, the, they are a vector um, and it can be found in both land and freshwater snails they are an intermediate host that's the word i'm looking for so the larvae develop inside these snails and slugs and um if you accidentally eat one uh then you also you too can become infected and it's through the ingestion of any uncooked infected snail uh which has the nematode larvae and the results can be um, quite tragic at times. Uh, the symptoms can range from, uh, I believe, headaches and fevers to the point where like very difficult to diagnose if you don't have a serious case of it. Um, and unfortunately, in serious cases, it can lead to coma and death. And I know that there was a case, a very sad case in Australia of a young boy who had been dared by his friends to eat a slug. And he did. And a few hours later, he was sick and they were taking him to the hospital and he was um, uh, received, ended up with all sorts of neurological problems and then eventually died. Um, so, uh, you know, it's one of the things that I think people who study this are really keeping their eyes on. Uh, it, it can, like I said, if the symptoms are mild, it can be very difficult to diagnose, you know, how many people might accidentally eat a slug that's on a piece of produce. And I have, um, I have received produce that have, um, I have purchased produce that have had slugs on them. And I'm sure people who are eating straight out of their gardens have slugs and snails from time to time. You typically notice the snails earlier than the slugs. Um, but if you do eat them, you can become infected. And why, because of this, I am pretty, um, careful about washing all of my produce, even bags of lettuce that say that they've been pre-washed. I still make sure that I wash everything really well. Um, <laughs> so, uh, can you discuss? There we go. Okay, so I've also read that invasive snails are causing serious damage to agricultural crops, such as wheat in Washington and gumming up harvest machines. Are inroads being made on controls? That is not a question that I can answer. Um, I know that there are people down in Oregon State University who are working um, with farms and farmers on this. And uh, there is a fellow by the name, I believe, Rory McDonnell, who is a professor there, who um, is, he might be, he would be the pe best person to answer that. Um, you know, obviously some of these invasive snails and um, slugs can, beyond our own gardens, cause some real commercial uh, damage in terms of, you know, ruining crops, um, just the same as insects and other what people consider pests. But um, I don't really know what what people are doing to think about control mechanisms. Many people ask me, I mean, that is the number one question that I get is how can I kill them? And uh, <laughs> You know, anyone who studies insects or invertebrates gets that question regularly. And um, I don't like to tell people what to do uh, because ultimately we all have to decide what we want to do. Um, and we all have unique situations. So a farmer is gonna have a completely different situation than someone like me who has the luxury of allowing my kale to grow to, um, so that I can grow butterflies instead. But there are other people who, you know, might be relying on, on their garden for food throughout the year. So I don't like to um, tell people what to do, but I do wanna encourage people to think about 
the idea that, you know, all of these plants and animals have a right to be here um, just like we do. And if we want our environments to be biologically diverse and rich, then we need to make some room for them. Um, sometimes that might even include an invasive species from time to time. Melissa, this has been outstanding in terms of just, you know, it's just not, not just the general introduction, but there's kind of some more insights, right, in terms of how these, uh, you know, how these species, you know, are, are amongst us and how we can actually live with them. Yeah. You know, and it, uh, it, is it, is there a particular thread of research you're into now? I'm curious as to what, uh, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's your trope in terms of the next, next phase of understanding these things? Yeah, so we're actually, um, I'm working with Jan and Casey on, uh, we have a meeting at the end of this month, we're hopefully going to be talking about how to use the iNaturalist data, because we've been active, all three of us are extremely active on iNaturalist, uh, making our own observations, but probably more so spending ridiculous amounts of time uh, evaluating other observations that have been captured by the Slime Pacific Northwest project. And so we're going through those observations and trying to make sense. Um, like I said, you know, sometimes it's it's as, as surprising as like running across a picture of something, a slug that's been taken out at Bonnie Lake. And I looked at it and said, that's a worm slug. That's the worm slug that I've been finding around Seattle. And suddenly we just hopped from Seattle down to Bonnie Lake. So um, I was just finishing up a, a joint paper with someone. So we were able to slide that data in there. And, um, you know, sometimes it's just these one-off stories, but one of the things that Casey and I have, and Jan have been talking about is how can we use some of the data across the um, project to answer questions about looking at things like introduced species and also some of the rare species and what's going on with that because we now and you know I, 10 years ago we did not have this kind of data at our fingertips and you couldn't actually go out and capture this data as a single person i mean just going back to that iNaturalist um, website where you see all of the observations throughout the world, um, there's just massive amounts of data that's being captured by community science scientists. And it's really important data. And it's data that can be ground truthed. So it's not just one off. Um, oh, I think I saw this slug and it looked like this. And then you have to figure out, well, what is it that someone was talking about? Maybe it's this species or maybe it's that species. There's an actual photo that allows us to evaluate what that species is. So we can get an idea of the range of certain species, you know, how far they've moved to different areas, things like the chocolate slug and the um, black slug, you know, that idea of moving up into the Ho River Valley is something that's quite remarkable for that I was surprised to see. Um, so we're gonna start looking at the data and try to carve out a few um, papers that we're interested in writing. And then for a quick, um, you know, just for, again, for the quick identification of those native banana slugs, right? Is the, is the keel is particularly unique in terms that's, of that? Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, uh, one thing I, I didn't show you that I have two slides at the end here is um, how to identify a snail. And there's lots of different traits, just like in plants, there's lots of traits, everything starting from the head, from the tentacles and the eyes. Um, there's a pneumostome, there's the shell itself, which is really characteristic for the shelled snails. Um, and usually for the shelled snails, we look at things like um, the, the actual size first, and then the, the, the dimensions, as well as any color patterns or sculpture. Um, we look at things like if you flip a shell over, there's an umbilicus or not an umbilicus um, at the bottom of a, of a shell. Um, the columella sometimes have structure on it. The outer lip can either be, um, have a flare to it or recurved to it. So there's lots of different traits and the combination of those traits is what makes a species a species, just like in a plant, right? And there's keys out there. And then for slugs, 
we have a, another set of traits. Again, starting at the head, tentacles, head, um, mantle itself, the texture of the mantle. Um, the pneumostome is actually one of the first, it, that's the hole, the breathing hole on the side of a slug and also snails have them too, but they're really obvious on slugs. And the pneumostome, the position of the pneumostome is one of the first things that I look at when I look at a slug in my mind. If the pneumostome is positioned towards the front of the mantle, then you know automatically that it's either a tail dropper or an aerion. And then if it's uh, towards the back of the mantle, as in this case, it's all of the other species. So that kind of like puts you on that fork right away. So that's a really good trait. Um, things like the tail, the sculpture on the tail, like whether it's smooth, whether it has turbicles, the keel, I have starred because again, the keel is really unique for banana slugs. A lot of people would take a picture of this slug and think that it was a black slug. They would be surprised, you know, people who are not from, particularly people who are not from the Pacific Northwest, but even people from the Pacific Northwest will be like, oh, I didn't know banana slugs were black. They can be. Um, and so you have to look at the traits and the structures for these guys. And the keel is that strong ridge that goes all the way along like a good portion of the tail. And some of the other species have keels too. They're called the keeled back um, slugs, um, but they have, but it's just at the very tip of their tail. And so, and so finally to that point, Melissa, is there a technique for handling slugs? You know? <laughs> Good question. Uh, make sure you don't have DEET on your hands. Um, I, I am, I do pick up the animals because of course I photograph them. And so you can see I'm into the photography of them because I think that, you know, presenting them in a way that makes them more charming can win people over. So I'm kind of committed to that and it's fun to do. So I'm handling these animals on a regular basis. Um, and like I said, sometimes it's fun because you can actually get a robust lance tooth to bite you. And that's pretty cool too. Um, but yeah, don't have any perfumes, lotions, or um, any chemicals on your hands because they are sensitive, just like many animals are to those. Um, I also, you know, snails and slugs um, don't like salt. So, you know, I, I do wash my hands sometimes when I'm hiking to kind of remove the salts on my hands, although I don't think it's particularly um, the salt is not high enough that it's painful for them, but that's something that I do think about from time to time. And then when you are finished handling a snail or a slug, I encourage you to wash your hands. Um, if you carry wet wipes or something like that, um, or just using water from your water bottle, if you have extra, uh, the slime can usually isn't so bad that, you know, you have gobs of it and it can be rubbed off once it dries. But um, I do encourage people to wash their hands mainly because there are things like rat lungworm that we just don't know that much about. And, you know, we don't, I just want to make sure that people stay safe there too. Other questions for Melissa. This has been incredibly informative and fascinating. Yeah, I have a question about, uh, are, are they detritus feeders? I saw uh, look like a brown slug eating a rat. And then a mountain lion killed a deer on my property and what she didn't eat, there were slugs all over the carcass. Good point. Um, okay, so yes, there are, I mentioned some of the snails are herbivores and then I said detritivores, meaning that they will feed on decaying material. But John, you bring up a really excellent point and fascinating natural history um, observation that I, have never seen in real life, but through the power of iNaturalist, because of all the community scientists are out there taking pictures, I've seen them feeding on dead birds and on dead mammals. And I always um, favorite those observations because it's not very common, but it, it is happening. And so, yeah, they absolutely, and it's not every species will feed on you know, a dead mammal or a dead bird, um, but they're 
there are examples of certain species feeding on them. And it's just, it's amazing. I mean, I'm sure also most of you know that they will feed on excrement from dogs or other animals that are in the forest. We have all seen that. And that, that does make me, gives me pause for handling these animals, <laughs> knowing what they feed on. But um, yeah, they, they will, they're great to try to bores. Many species are known to be important nutrient recyclers for our forests. Um, they play a large role that way ecologically. And, you know, people ask, well, what does a slug do or what does a snail do? And, you know, every animal, plant and animal and fungi have a role on this planet. And, you know, in certain places like forests, they are, they're good nutrient recyclers. So they will take that dead animal and they will poop it out as nutrients that can get used um, by a plant or a fungi. So other questions for Melissa? Melissa, this has been incredibly helpful. And it, uh, you know, indeed, I think you've, you've, ele you've, you've elevated the species, right, to a species of respect, <laughs> yeah. you know, as opposed to, you know, as opposed to, to disdain. So, it, uh, you know, you've done your job, right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, people are interested in, you um, and getting in touch with me, uh, my email is freyma at uw.edu. It was on the title slide, and Kelly, I'm sure you can, you can, you're welcome to share that out. Um, and again, I encourage people to stop by the Burke. Um, we have open labs now, or like uh, windows into our labs, so you can often see the kind of work that we're doing and some of the collections that we're working on. One thing I will mention is that that is one of the areas of the Burke that. Uh, we don't have a strong snail and uh, land snail and slug collection. And that's something that historically has been dictated by uh, the fact that we didn't have the type of storage space in the old building. But with the new building, we do have that. And so we are able to grow our collection in that way. Thank you so much for joining us here, Melissa. You know, this has been great. You know, it's highly valued. We really would, and mind you, a shout out, of course, for everybody for the Burke, right? You know, is that uh, it is a, what, a, what a great place to visit. Um, and of course, with the cafeteria there, you know, you can spend hours there, right? You know, it, it's, a, it's date night, practically. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Thanks much. Okay. Thanks and with a lot. That, with that, I want to take you back then to it, uh, take you back to us. And it, uh, let's go back to it, uh, to us here and where we're standing here today. Thank you, Melissa. Bye. Hey, with that, then I'm going to go and close off the, at, um, the meeting, the formal meeting. Rhonda, go ahead and uh, ask your question here. It's actually for Karen. <laughs>